Welcome to a vital psychedelic conversation with Sarah Reed and Alex H. Robinson. Lovely to be here. Um, I'm super excited about this. Loads and loads to talk about. Um, and I think the first thing to say is congratulations on both getting married. Uh, it's been a big year for both of you. So, uh, yeah, how's life so far? <laughs> Thank you. Life is good. I am still in newlywed bliss and hope to keep it for as long as possible. Yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm happy that it's summertime in Portland. So grateful. And uh, we just bought a house here as well. So I'm very happy about that. Mm. Yeah, and you've both recently moved. Alex, you're in, in Oregon and Sarah, you're in London town, my old stumping ground. So I'd um, love to hear about how those two places are now from a life perspective. Um, so let's just jump in. Uh, in your own words, can you tell folks a wee bit about yourself? Maybe Sarah, would you like to um, go first just with introducing you, your work, life and approach? Mm, sure. So I am Sarah Reed. I am a marriage and family therapist by clinical background and uh, a lover of the countryside, um, I feel like for a long time. I'm born and raised in the state of Kentucky, small country town called Hawkinsville. And yeah, have found my way to be living my life in London these days. Uh, and to give a bit of a, a trajectory of how I got here, I'll, I'll say my origin story in the field of psychedelics starts with clinical research. And I definitely was someone by no means who had any interest in working with psychedelics or really even any interest in being a mental health therapist, but that's another story for another time. Uh, what I will say is I was divinely pushed in uh, to this area and I've been here since 2017. And that journey starts with the MDMA therapy for PTSD trial, where I was a study therapist providing participants of color with the culturally informed therapeutic experience. And from there, I joined a research team at Yale University studying psilocybin for depression, was there not long enough to see a participant on that trial, but long enough to uh, contribute to the therapy manual. And started working with ketamine as well um, and have a special um, place in my heart for work with ketamine and really respect ketamine um, as a medicine. And yeah, as I am, you know, my origin story starts in uh, clinical research. I was living my life in the state of Connecticut and then 2020 hits and the COVID-19 pandemic happens. And like many folks, I, reflected on what was important to me in my life. And uh, for me, that was to be closer to family and to really start my, um, or continue my life uh, back in Kentucky. And so moved back in the middle of the pandemic and thought I was gonna live out my days um, in Kentucky, but um, this is not the most professional story to tell, but I met my now husband on a dating app called Hinge. Highly recommend that app for folks if folks are interested in that. Um, that we matched on Hinge. Uh, the story of how we match is also another story for another time. But um, then I moved my entire life to London to, yeah, uh, build and be in this relationship. So I've built my life, started building my life in London with my now husband and decided to continue on this journey of psychedelic uh, research. And 
thankfully, I was able to get employed and get my visa sponsored by Imperial College London, where I am now the lead psychedelic research therapist, currently involved in uh, the OCD um, trial, which we're testing how well low to moderate doses of psilocybin can be useful for folks with OCD, as well as I am co-leading on the development of therapy manuals for our two upcoming addiction trials, both with gambling and opioid use disorder. Outside of my research work, I am a lover of plants. I'm trying to keep the ones I have around me alive. Um, I am a mom to three fish. And yeah, I'm trying to find ways to work in a sustainable way. Sounds great. It really does. Yeah. And it's interesting you've, you've got fish um i don't trust myself to have fish i've got two kids but fish i just, I just think i can't do that but and I, yeah interesting my wife and i met on a jewish dating website as well and so i don't okay. did that alex did can i ask you did you meet your wife on a dating app by any chance or is that yeah no i, I actually like to say when people ask that i say we met the old-fashioned way on a dating app <laughs> uh, because that's the way of the world now um, I think I think we met on Hinge, but I think I always get that wrong. And then my wife says, "No, we met on Bumble," and then she <laughs> lights me up for having, you know, too many dating apps back in the day. So, <laughs> you know, you had to do what you had to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, um, yeah, Alex, you want to tell folks a wee bit about you? Great to see you. Yeah, it's great to be here, and. Um, just awesome to hear your story, Sarah, as well, and and where you are on your on your path. Um, we are in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we bought a house in January in the middle of an ice storm, so don't recommend. Uh, but we're really happy to be here, and we have a great community here, which is wonderful that we kind of fell into. So my wife previously lived here. Um, story. Uh, was born in California, moved to Midwest uh, early on in my life. Um, the Army was really the only path for me forward uh, in terms of getting out of the circumstances that I was in and making a life for myself. Um, I joined in 2007 and went to college during that time. Uh, got on active duty in 2010 uh, as a military intelligence officer. At the time, women serving in different uh, fields was not allowed, so we were very restricted. Uh, so women were restricted in, in terms of where they could serve or what in what capacity they could serve, which was a hard thing for me because I never really agreed with the rules of our society at all and structures and regulations don't really fit in my um, repertoire. So being told no was not an answer I liked. Um, thankfully, there was a program when I joined active duty to circumvent the policies on women serving in combat. And I immediately put my name in the hat to go to that assessment and selection. Uh, the program was called the Cultural Support Team and essentially paired women uh, with male special operations, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and Rangers, amongst others, to serve in a um, attachment enabler capacity on missions in Afghanistan. Um, there's a lot I could go into there, but uh, it was a long career. Um, lots of deployments and a lot of beautiful things, a lot of beautiful people I met along the way. Um, but uh, war is not something that I ever want us to go into again. And we continually as a world continue to do those things. Um, so there's been a lot of healing for me post that career and peeling back the onion of the military industrial complex and what that does 
to our society and us as a human species. Um, I got out in 2020, not a good, not a good year to get out of the military. I uh, was not doing well, uh, to say the least. And um, my now wife had basically gave me the, you need to, you need to get help. Um, so we split at the time. And um, I had a friend reach out and get me down to Mexico to get uh, psychedelic healing support because the VA's path was just not working of medicines and um, talk therapy. It just didn't, it didn't cut it for PTSD and all the other things that were happening with me. Um, so I'm very grateful. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for plant medicine. Um, and I, I went and got a master's degree in organizational psychology and I now support um, really focusing on young women, minorities, LGBTQIA, um, and leadership development and coaching um, support. Uh, a big passion of mine is to see more uh, minority people in, in leadership in all industries. We don't have enough of that, and we need to help those individuals believe in themselves to, to move up in, in their careers. Um, I also work for Heroic Cards Project as a coach and a liaison on international retreats to Mexico and Peru, um, as well as uh, I now live in Oregon, like I said, so I'm a psilocybin facilitator um, where we have just done our first ever Heroic Cards legal Oregon veteran retreat. Um, and I also work at Intertrek, which is a... Um, service center here in downtown Portland, um, supporting LGBTQIA, BIPOC, and all individuals uh, with psilocybin facilitation. So I think that's the short of it. I'm sure there's more, oh, there's a huge one. Um, I also, along my healing journey, have uh, recultivated my passion for writing and um, Someone said to me once, if you have an artistic bone in your body that survives your military career, you better follow it, um, which I don't disagree with. So uh, I am getting, or I've gotten back into writing poetry and prose, and I put my name in the hat to attend a very uh, prestigious uh, creative writing program, Sarah Lawrence in New York City, and happened to, got, happened to get selected. So I will be going back and forth from Portland to New York for the next two years, uh, attending that creative writing program. So I'm very happy about that. So happy you squeeze that writing piece in, Alex. Yeah. And if it's okay to say in the graduation ceremony from, from your uh, cohort two of, of Vital, I think you read a, a poem that you'd written as well that was really powerful and really moving. So yeah, it's great that that's, that is alive in you. Beautiful. All right, so we have arrived, we're here. Um, a question that we always ask in a vital psychedelic conversation, particularly because you know, we're coming at it from the perspective of being a teacher and a student, what for you is one of the most important topics right now that you believe we should all be talking about in regards to psychedelic therapy and medicine and healing, but just in regards to life and being a human on planet Earth? So very broad, but what's maybe just one of the things that really kind of that you're feeling is important to talk about right now? Um, Sarah, would it be right to ask you to, to go first as well? Mm. What feels vital to talk about in the field of psychedelic therapy is adequate therapist training. For me, as someone who was a participant in a healthy volunteer trial and experienced a microaggression in an altered state of consciousness, I feel like it is critical to continue to talk about the importance of culturally sensitive and culturally responsible practices, which 
in my honest opinion, most psychedelic therapy training programs will have maybe a module on cultural sensitivity or a guest lecture and um, say, at least exposing students to ideas around uh, diversity and ethical considerations, cultural considerations around this work, which is great. But I find that most training programs actually don't equip practitioners on how to be more culturally sensitive. Like what are the practical things to do to be more culturally sensitive? And I am appreciative of uh, many psychedelic therapy training programs focusing on, you know, the self of the therapist or the self of the guide, having guides be introspective about their own traumas or about their own uh, pains. And I say, let's take this conversation a step further and talk about what are guides' biases, what are therapists' biases that can come up in this work. Because what I find is that it's not just about knowing the interventions to to do in a session. It's about who you are and how you're trained and how you relate to who who is in the room or who is in the space that that maybe has more of an impact on uh, what you do and what interventions you choose. So that's, um, yeah, that for me is the most, or is a vital topic to talk about in the space of psychedelic therapy. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. And, and just stick in with that for a, another question, because this is something that we are teaching in Vital and we are trying different ways and iterating. And um, it's, it's a hard, really hard topic to teach, especially virtually uh, with people around the world. So like, what have you found like works? Like, What is an essential component of this as an experience of kind of gaining competence, awareness and skills? Like what's a good teaching approach? Um, that enables students to really get what we are talking about here so that they can kind of use this as a skill live interactively with another human being that they're supporting. Hmm. Yeah, I will start by saying that I don't have the capital T or capital A answers that um, I think this is something that we are still figuring out as a field. And what I will say in my experience with Vital as, um, as a, both a lecturer and a study group lead is that the lectures are great and they are useful and important and are necessary. And you can't just stop the learning at the lecture. That what I found really useful is after the lecture that I did um, in my study group, that we were really able to personalize what came up for folks with the content that was raised and be more in a more reflective space around the content that was raised. And I think that that part is really, really critical in being able to self-reflect um, and also be in a container where you've um, where you have colleagues and peers that you've been in a journey with for some time, um, where you can talk about um, topics like this. And not to say every study group uh, was like the study group that I had, uh, but that is something that comes to mind, is having the self-reflective piece um, that's in a group setting part of the um, integration of the lecture. At the same time, I think it's it can be really tricky to have conversations around culturally responsible care because um, these topics can be triggering for folks in a variety of different ways, for um, folks who have uh, lots of points of privilege and maybe a lot of ignorance about the topic or folks who have lived experience. And we often learn from the lived experiences of those who have been historically oppressed. And so, yeah, I think it's it's a tricky um, 
topic to navigate given the containers that we have for psychedelic assisted therapy right now, which are largely online, um, largely composed of a lecture and study groups. Um, but that's something that comes to mind. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I, and just mentioning the container piece feels really important. Like we primarily let's build the container that can hold these kinds of difficult conversations. And if we don't build the container, then yeah, these conversations aren't safe to have. It's not ready exactly. yet. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, I wanted to check in with Alex. What, what's coming up for you is something that feels vital to be talking about right now. I was going to go a different direction, but now hearing that, Sarah, I think what came up for me when you were talking is the vital necessity to continue to do your own work if you're going to work in this space. And, you know, I was just recently at um, Trakuna's conference uh, a couple months ago. And one of the things that Bia had said to the collective at one of the days was we're creating this culture this new psychedelic culture we're creating it so we have to one continue to do our own work and two be okay with hard conversations and calling each other out when we see something that doesn't feel right doesn't look right isn't right and that's very difficult to do and i think people tend to fall back on those everything's love and light and we are you know all of these these psychedelic phrases and we're all one and and everything like that and and yeah that's true and right yeah. uh, the, the, we get stuck in these binaries with everything so i think that really calls to me is the continuing to do your own work and i, I say as a, as a, there's no one group I'm calling out here, but I, I mean, examples of, I just was at this LGBTQIA conference with a lot of leaders who are doing research and um, deep in the field. And many of them shared with me that they only support queer identity people. And that's okay, that's their choice if they want to, absolutely. But what I heard from a lot of them was still a deep rooted level of fear and pain and work that needs to, that onion needs to be peeled back, right? And, and I'm not saying that's easy, but you can't carry that around in this world and then expect change, right? And I recently had a male veteran who's working in the psilocybin Oregon space who said, in his experience, the military wasn't racist. And I was like, no, buddy. <laughs> mm. And I immediately called him out. And I'm like, that's just not mm. true. That's your lived experience as a white man. And he was, one, very receptive because I didn't attack him. He was open to the conversation. Um, and me just being curious and saying, hey, I really encourage you to look deeper at that. Right. But that goes back to what Sarah was saying of like having these conversations and those individuals, if you, if we as a collective need to be, even if it's uncomfortable, being like, hey, I see you and I think you're probably going to be a great practitioner in this space with whatever role you are playing and you've got to keep doing your own work. Um, because I see a lot of people that want to jump into this space very quickly. And that is very concerning for me, myself included, right? I continually take a step back and say, ooh, like I'm going to do my own work this month because you need to, you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Oh, there's a lot there. <laughs> Um, awesome. I think a, a place that I'd like us to meet at, the three of us, is around difficult conversations. Uh, and what springs to mind is something I know about both of you is, is having difficult conversations in, in the past and some of your work. So, you know, Alex, you were saying, kind of working with Heroic Hearts Project, you have had difficult conversations with Jesse Gould, who's an amazing man and 
kind of founder of Heroic Hearts about the project there and um, and how to make it more inclusive with the people you're working with. And, and Sarah, for you, I know you've worked with Monica Williams on a few different projects and papers, and one of those being uh, maps, you know, now like us, um, and their research design um, with the participants not being uh, representative on a, from a racial level. So maybe just talk, can we use those as two kind of examples of how the conversations were framed and, and how to kind of make improvements in the real world around psychedelic treatment, therapy, and trial design. Because I think those are just so real, if that's okay. I'm about to take a sip of water on this one, because <laughs> <laughs> Here we go, yeah. You know, I will, I will say to that, and Sarah, I'd, I'd love to honestly hear more from you on this, be, just because of your experience of working with Monica and all the research you've done. I will say on that, so many individuals when I have these conversations still come from the mindset of it's a zero sum game. And meaning if I'm asking for something that's taking away from you and that we need to just wake up to that not be a reality. Right. Um, which is why I appreciate heroic hearts and I have appreciated Jesse every time we come to him and say, Hey, the staff even, because every person who is a marginalized identity, not every person, but I, I think a lot, you go to the website and you look who's on their staff, who works there. What are their values? Because that shows immediately. So that's something we're trying to shift, right? Our our heroic hearts is a very large organization, but what's on the on the web page is is a certain demographic of individuals. Um, or I go to them and say, hey, like you know, our, our coach, we need more diversity within our coaches. We're doing that. We're creating that. Hey, we 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 need to have retreats that. You can have a retreat with all different identities and have an amazing healing experience. And there are some people, depending on where they are in their healing journey, that need a safer container. And that doesn't take away from the greater thing. It adds to, it's an additive. And we need to move away as a collective from thinking that one takes away from the other. Um, and Jesse's been... And the entire Hero Card staff has been very open to that. So we've done, you know, multiple LGBTQIA retreats this year, which and veteran retreats, which the intersection of those identities I never thought in my lifetime I would be a part of. And it was truly historical and amazing. Um, I, I spoke with, you know, said this earlier to Sarah, but I, I don't think we're ready to, to run BIPOC retreats because I don't think our staff is ready for that. I think we need more education. I think we need more um, people of color to facilitate that. Um, but I think we'll get there and we're open to getting there. Um, and we're running all female retreats for veteran females um, because military sexual trauma is huge. And some of those women are not ready to be in an altered state with a male veteran that looks very similar to who could have potentially been their perpetrator. So I'm very grateful for the, the ability that we've had to have those hard conversations as a staff, to continue to know that we have room to grow and evolve. Um, yeah, but I, like I said, I'd love to hear from Sarah on her experiences and what she's come up against um, because I know that it's it's a constant ongoing thing. And, and I'll just be honest too, you know, I'm a, queer gender queer individual but i also moved through this world as a female and i've spent a long time code switching and a long time uh learning how to convince men that what i gave as an idea is their idea uh so that they execute it and i am an expert at that <laughs> so uh, and i'll keep doing it i don't care and that's not to say that uh 
uh, I don't love them so wholeheartedly. It's just to say that like that's this we live in a patriarchal society and that is something that we just have to be transparent about. Yes, yes, yes. I resonate so much with what you're saying, Alex, around the work being continuous and the work being ongoing, because that is exactly what it's felt like um, to start. Um, yeah, the, the main reason why we even became selected as a study site, or one of the main reasons why I'll say is because MAPS recognize the lack of racial diversity in their participant pool. And so they're like, if we're, if we're adamant and, and desire to bring this drug-assisted therapy to uh, FDA approval, we need to get our population pool um, more representative to uh, the racial demographics of the US. And so as we were um, appointed for this very big task of increasing uh, racial diversity, um, you would think that, you know, things just fell into place and all is well that we got the participant recruitment that, you know, we wanted. And that wasn't the case always. And what I mean by that is we were met with resistance because one thing that I found in doing this work is that it's not just about doing justice work um, and actually putting into practice the things that you know. A huge component of this work is educating folks as to why this is important. And so as we were met with defensiveness or questioning in some points, um, we had to uh, educate folks along the way of why this is important or why participants were taking longer um, to um, in the informed consent phase, because, you know, there's a lot of stigma around psychedelics. There's a lot of stigma around uh, receiving mental health care, that these barriers that we had to overcome just to uh enroll and retain participants of color. We also had to, yeah, really check ourselves in our own privilege too, that just because we are folks of color from a variety of different uh, racial ethnic backgrounds, that just because we are um, physically represented doesn't mean that people of color are automatically going to enroll in the trial because that's not actually what happened initially. That we had to humble ourselves and yeah, really um, figure out, given the constraints of the research trial, how can we uh, recruit and retain folks of color? And I'm grateful that we were able to do that from um, a recruitment strategy that wasn't just talking about, you know, the science behind MDMA therapy or what the research is about, but it was myself and another guide at the time talking about our lived experiences as people of color in a psychedelic therapy trial and uh, the highs and the lows of what that experience was like. Um, that that was uh, the most recruit, uh, effective recruitment strategy and really taught me a lot about, yeah, um, what the field is going to have to do or what we um, will need to do in, if psychedelic assisted therapy is going to become medicalized, that there has to be a lot more intention around making this uh, treatment accessible to folks. Another initiative that... Um, I did, along with Monica Williams, Jamila George, Natalie Ginsberg, uh, Marcela Ortalora, um, was, and Shane and Claire was this um, therapist of color training that MAPS um, created this, um, or partially funded, I believe this uh, therapist of color training where therapists of color from all across the US came 
to my home state of Kentucky to uh, engage in uh, uh, MDMA therapy uh, training. There's lots to say about what was gained from that therapeutic um, training, um, which will be another conversation for another time. But um, I think what that training experience exposed to MAPS is that, ooh, we got some things that we need to figure out if we are truly going to make this uh, treatment accessible for um, folks of a variety of um, racial ethnic backgrounds. And yeah, I'll maybe pause here with um, the last thing uh, which I'm doing at Imperial right now, which is creating um, culturally sensitive uh, CRFs or clinical research forms that actually help support guides, whether it's on a healthy volunteer trial or whether it's on a clinical trial with asking questions that really are going to help us better care for folks having a psychedelic experience. It's not just limited to racial identity questions or gender identity questions, but it also is inclusive of neurodiversity, sexuality, um, and a lot of other things. And I am proud that we are developing uh, this tool um, and my hope is that um, for future trials to come, that this is going to be something that gets implemented and that we'll write about this so that, you know, this can be replicated across other uh, research trials. So it's not just us, you know, doing culturally sensitive things, but it's a it's a global movement for how can we make experiences safer for folks that come from a variety of different cultural backgrounds. I um, would love to see that. I don't know if you can share that widely, but I would absolutely love to see that. Um, it will absolutely be sure. Something you said that I think is so, so potent uh, was the piece of using your story as a, as being the most effective recruitment tool. And I think that matters so much. And I also see that in my spaces with, um, you know, the old uh, old uh, saying of, if you build it, they will come. Well, that's not really the, the truth if you don't educate individuals on what it is from a voice that they trust and see and hear themselves in, which is why representation matters. Representation matters so that can happen. Um, so like when we did our first, I was so fearful when we did our first all female and we did our first LGBTQIA retreats because I was like, if we don't get participation, they're going to be like, well, see, we don't need this. Mm-hmm. And then it's a um, data point for them, you know, of saying we don't need to do this. And so, I mean, I've tried to push it to every channel I possibly could to get you know uh, engagement the reality is many 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 marginalized identities people of color LGBTQIA women they leave the the military and they are very much angry they get stuck in the oh I just operated within a homophobic racist sexist environment for so long and I want nothing to do with it especially those queer people who were kicked out because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So they don't even identify as a veteran. Desire to be near other veterans or exist in those spaces. So then they don't seek the support or help that they could potentially benefit from because of those things. Um, So I just, I really love that you shared that because I think continuing to be a voice, continuing to say this has been helpful for me um, and here's why, you know, uh, I think it's really important to to bring in other identities to get them the help that they need. Mm -hmm. I so love and 
appreciate what you're saying around uh, representation matters because it absolutely does. And I've got a question for you, Alex, that is coming up for me around the topic of representation and the intersection of safe containers. And that question is, do you think it is safe for LGBTQ, LGBTQIA folks to sit with straight folks in psychedelic therapy? Hmm. I think it depends, right? I think it depends, and I think it depends for any historically and systemically excluded individual or community. And I'm not going to get this right because I forget the psychology phrasing and you could probably help me, but it's the, it's a, the theory of, you know, what le level of healing, where you are in your stages of healing development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as when you, you know, Initially, you're still uh, like for a person of color, they would want a white person as their therapist. As they go further, then they only want a person of color as their therapist. And they, so those stages, I think it's the same. I think that's why I say for some, it doesn't matter the identity, you could be in a safe cohort. And for some, they need that container to fully be and express themselves. For some, there's still so such deep levels of self hate and shame that they don't even know. And they, we have veterans all the time, like, oh, I don't want to go to an LGBTQIA retreat. I don't want to. I don't. I don't need to identify that with that. I like. I'm. I'm a. I used to even say this as an individual. I'm a normal person. I'm a. Yeah. I'm a. I'm not a rainbow gay. I, and I'm mm. like, what does that even mean? But the level of shame and self-hatred that I was programmed with to have to peel that onion back, I still see with people who leave the military and they're like, no, I'm a veteran. You know, I puff their chest out, ego. It's, I'm not queer. My queer identity is just this over here. And them not even knowing that they're going to, they're going to have to go sit with that. Right. So to, I mean, the longer answer to your question is yes, I think that can be possible. Um, and it, and it also depends. And, and I've, I've sat in retreats with people where we're all just mirrors to each other and you're going to have some straight person who doesn't realize how homophobic they are. And then we'll say something, and then me as the one facilitating that dynamic has to really work through those things without harming anyone, right? Without ostracizing that individual or making them feel othered, and while also keeping the other participants safe. Um, so it's, I mean, it's just difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if that really answers the question. <laughs> It absolutely does and resonates as well that it depends and it's difficult that, um, yeah, for me, what's coming up is if we truly want, if the intention is to make psychedelic assisted care, psychedelic assisted work accessible to folks from a variety of identities and intersectionalities, it feels important to also bring into the conversation diverse models of care that I feel like um, for the most part, I don't think it's safe for folks of color to have experiences with psychedelics with white folks. Not to say that it hasn't happened before or it's not happening now or folks of color haven't had safe experiences what I'm saying is based off of not just my own experience, but what I've heard in supervision circles, that there's still a lot of implicit bias that comes into the room 
that um, that impacts the way uh, that participants are held and contained, at least in research trials. And there's um, a part of me that acknowledges the importance of having representation in all sectors and domains of care with work with psychedelics, whether it's in the medicalization of psychedelics, whether it's in the retreat uh, space, et cetera. Um, and there's also another part of me that's like, um, that thinks about um, the container, like this organization or this movement, maybe I'll call it, uh, that's titled A Table of Our Own, uh, that's focused on uh, Black folks in psychedelia that who are artists, who are mycologists, who are researchers, academics, dancers, um, who are who come together and work with psychedelics and um, and yet create safe spaces for Black folks. That to me, it feels um, equally important as we have conversations about accessibility with psychedelics. That we also acknowledge the limitations that. Um, are present in, uh, as you truthfully describe, Alex, a racist, homophobic, transphobic, patriarchal uh, healthcare system. And so that acknowledging that safer spaces exist where folks can tap into um, is also um, um, a, a part of the conversation too. Mm. Yeah, thank you both. That was a really awesome conversation you, you both shared. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. So a couple of things I want to throw out there. One thing that popped on my head, Sarah, is um, in our vital cohort, you introduced the cultural genogram. So if anyone wants to just um, check that out, can Google it. I'm looking at it now. Pretty picture. But yeah, so it's a, also a tool for exploring and uh, feeling into yeah your culture, family, history and uh, stories and narratives. Um, and as a closing question, uh, both of you are doing amazing work in many different areas, but when it comes to psychedelic assisted therapy. So Sarah, I'd love to hear a bit about what you're working on at Imperial, some of the trials. I know there's the OCD and psilocybin, if there's maybe one really beautiful point that you want to share there. And, and Alex, you are doing legal psilocybin work in Oregon. So I'm, I know it's new and fresh. I don't know if there's any experiences there that, that you want to share or just some, just something that kind of is resonating about the calling around these pieces of work that you're doing, which I'm very jealous of, but proud of that you're doing it. It's amazing. Yeah, my statements about work with psychedelics are, yeah, our OCD trial is uh, wrapping up, which feels quite exciting because we're now looking at the data to, to make sense of what, um, yeah, what the results are. And what I'll say is, is that I am hopeful that we will have more conversations publicly around low, low, moderate doses of psilocybin, because I feel like psychedelic therapy is always about like high dose experiences and, you know, these mind bending, melting experiences. And they're, um, at least what I can say clinically in the room there is a lot of great work that happens in low moderate dose sessions. Um, so yeah, that's all Beautiful. I'll share. And maybe that's why you like ketamine so much because you know, I think it has a magical ability at the psycholytic dose. And, and with the OCD trial, is the psilocybin, is it an ongoing or is it just maybe just a, a small number of treatments? Yeah, it's two, a two session treatment um, a maximum dose of 10 milligrams and yeah, um, to your point, David, yeah, I have such a love for psycholytic sessions just because I honestly think they're easier to integrate, uh, than having higher dose experiences, but yeah. that's Sarah um 2024 sarah saying this let's check in in a couple of years to see if she says the same thing deal yeah yeah give it give us all the space to grow and change everything we said here <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner i'm constantly 
<laughs> evolving as a human being. Um, I'll just say the Oregon model is great. It's a great start. There is a lot that needs to be shifted and adjusted as as it continues, which you know people are really trying to do that. Um, Colorado is learning from our mistakes, you know. So <laughs> there's that. I I look forward to the day that I hope either myself or Heroic Hearts as a collective organization has a retreat center and um, that is outdoors and not restricted to these indoor facilities that don't feel good with you know m- music playing over Spotify and all the things that don't feel right <laughs> um, at all. So I look forward to that shift happening. Um, and I'm very grateful that we're doing it because there's realities that my wife likes to check me on all the time, which is not everyone feels comfortable going to Peru or Mexico to um, do plant medicine and especially doing it in a more traditional way. There's a lot of the westernized programming, the war on drugs, all of those things makes that feel very fearful for a lot of people. And when we're talking about PTSD and we're talking about veterans specifically, accessibility and, and, and support needs to happen. Um, so the fact that we're able to start doing this work in Oregon, I feel very grateful for. Um, and that will lead me in my, into my only parting thing, which is that you know the MDMA conversation is uh, at the height of everyone's mind right now and obviously is being voted on soon. And um, that is a means to support a lot of people in our country. And I'm not saying we're doing it perfectly and I'm not saying it, it's uh, the trials were done exactly the way they should have been because they weren't. And there's a lot of room for growth and, and mm-hmm. the VA is ready to roll out MDMA assisted therapy. And we, we are talking about saving thousands of lives and, the fact that we are having these conversations going back to, you know, systems and structures, not being people. Um, yes. The military industrial complex is, a dis- this is Alex's opinion is disgusting. I want nothing to do with it. And, and those systems that we've created are, are racist and they are sexist and they are homophobic. And there are people within those systems that deserve healing. And this is a way to get them that. So I am very adamant that we have those conversations of the world is not binary. We need to support people. Here is a path to doing that. Why are we arguing about it? Why are we fighting each other? Um, so yeah, I leave that, that final, final, final thought. I know that's a larger conversation, but um, yeah, I just think it could really bring a lot of support to a lot of people who need it. Thank you, Alex. So this was part one. How about that? Um, There is a lot more for part two. So stay tuned, everybody. Uh, Before we say toodaloo, tell folks how they can find out more about you. Um, Where should they go? Um, And maybe Sarah, yeah, do you want to go first? Hmm. Yeah, so for folks interested in following me or saying hello, uh, you can reach out at info. that's S-A-R-A-J-R-E-E-D.info, or just find me on LinkedIn and send me a message. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, I was going to pull up, I think my, <clears throat> I think my website, which is about to launch is alexrobinson.org, but you're going to have to check me on that and correct me. Um, but you can find me on LinkedIn um, at Alex Horton Robinson, and I have a website that will be live soon here where you can directly book with me for Oregon Psilocybin Facilitation. It also just uh, routes people to Heroic Arts' page as well. Um, but yeah, it was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so good. thank you. Thank you. This is gorgeous. Um, I would love to do it again. So thanks so much for being with us, Alex and Sarah. And and thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great day.